we want to fight to save our industry uh, of classic cars, even if classic means 1998. You're listening to the Get Out and Drive podcast with John Custom Car Nerd Meyer and Jason Old Car Guy Car. We'll be bringing you gearheads everything you never wanted to know about cars and why they should be on the road and not in your garage. Are you ready to get out and drive? Guys, welcome back to another fantabulistic Get Out Drive podcast. My name is Jason Old Car Guy Car. And I am John Custom Car Nerd Meyer. John, we've been hearing in the news an awful lot lately about how EPA and uh, our industry, the automotive industry, is, in my opinion, being attacked uh, for things like, you know, emissions and, uh, you know, certain things that we do in our in in our community right down to they've changed our paint uh, and stuff like that. So. We're, we're dealing now with people who just simply want to drive their vehicles, their hot rods, their classics as daily drivers. And we're running into troubles, John. What kind of troubles are we running into with these people just plating their vehicles as antiques and daily driving them? If you had a vintage car and traditionally and still everywhere, it's from today's date, 25 years prior um, from, from this model year, that is considered a vintage car um, by us law i don't know how they do it in canada um, but i know that uh, in the united states that's that's where everybody starts and it was fine when people wanted to drive a 55 chevrolet and this and that and they drove it a limited time throughout the year you're supposed to keep a log book you're supposed to keep uh i think it, the minimum somebody correct me if i'm wrong but i think it was under 2000 miles a year uh they had lots of limitations they had a big long thing that said you're only supposed to go for uh display of the vehicle um for uh tuning and adjustments and for parades and all sorts of stuff and and that was very limited use for the vehicle because they wanted to make sure that if you had the those limited use license plates, you weren't driving the car every day. The world progressed and time marched on. Technology with cars got better and better and better. Now, 25 years previous to now is considered a used car to me. And it's not a Model T. It's not a Model A. It's not a very difficult to drive car. It's a generic truck that you'd see anyone driving on the road. Uh, 90s era vehicles are now considered classic collectible vintage cars and i think a lot of people are taking advantage of this getting collectible car license plates and they're putting it on these cars that are cheaper than regular standard issue license plates and they're driving them all the time no matter what and i think they're only doing that to skirt having to constantly inspect and renew license plates on your car. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's becoming harder and harder for the average Joe just to enjoy what it is he bought or built. And, you know, I want to jump in just for a split second and say, I don't know about you, but 25 years ago to me was 1980, <laughs> like not 1996, 97. Like right. this is the point that we're at now. If you're driving a 1997 Lincoln Town Car, like the one I just sold, um, there are still emissions standards that you have to meet with those cars. And if you're driving that as a regular, everyday plated car, well, you've got to meet those standards. But as soon as you're able to plate that as an antique, which technically it would be, you're now exempt from emissions testing and certain parameters and you can insure it for a heck of a lot cheaper because of the limitations and people are taking advantage of that now i've got two vehicles now that i that i do um insure as you know classic antique vehicles and i don't drive them every day we have winter here in canada so we really only have about five months of the year that we can really drive them and even still there's so many limitations Are people abusing this? Absolutely. I do believe that they are. And you're getting to the point now where when the annual registration time comes for these plates in certain states, and it's not so much in Canada yet, that you're having to prove your mileage, your upkeep, uh, any work that you've done, 
uh, you know, little stuff like that and that you have the proper insurance. So heaven forbid they record your mileage at the beginning of one registration period and three months later, you've got 6,000 miles on this car. What are they going to do? Like what, what are the, what are the penalties that are going to be imposed for abusing that system? I'd be interesting, interested to know what some of you folks think, John, what do you think? What do you think some of these penalties are going to be for people who abuse that system? I, I don't know. I, I think this is a new quote unquote problem uh, that the uh, U S obviously U S and Canada um, and, and certainly globally, it'll be an issue. Um, I, I think it's a new problem. that's going to be addressed. I don't know what happens if you are driving a vintage vehicle on classic car plates and, and driving it every day. I'm, I, I drive with, has regular plates on it and I pay my regular fee and everything. I have an 89 Jeep Cherokee that I drive all the time, every day. Uh, my Maverick regular plates on it all the time, every day. I, I don't, I don't think people are doing that. I think they're getting the cheaper plates. Like, I, I don't know, I'm making up numbers. I think it's several hundred dollars in, in Illinois to get, uh, regular plates for your, um, regular everyday day, daily driver car. But it's, it's an exorbitantly less amount if you're wanting to get vintage plates for your car because they think they're, you're not going to be driving it as much. I've gotten pulled over in, and I think this is probably in the early 90s, I was pulled over in a 71 Maverick, and it had v- v- antique auto license plates on it. And whatever officer pulled me over, I guess still had the plastic on his badge or whatever, and he's, he, he got out of the academy yesterday. Initial stop pulled me over because I was driving a car that he thought shouldn't have those vintage plates on it. And he didn't know what those were. And he stopped me to ask me, why do you not have current right license registration in your car? And I had to explain that to him. You're supposed to have a logbook, like you were saying, the word if you're supposed to do this. When you get pulled over or if you get pulled over as an initial stop and you have vintage license tags on your car, you're supposed to have a logbook that says on this date, I had this mileage and this is what I did. And you have to give them a reason why you're driving the car that day. It's for demonstration purposes. It's for you're headed to a parade. It's for testing, uh, whatever it is. But like I said, as technology increased, those rules are not necessarily applying for people that are driving cars that blend in to late model cars. It used to be you're driving what is quote unquote a late model car and all of those rules were for a car that was not as fast, didn't brake as well, uh, had, had mechanical limitations because 50s, 60s, 70s, they realized you could have antique license plate or they needed a, a, an antique license plate for cars because there was some goofball that's trying to drive a Model T in traffic and he certainly wasn't going to be driving that every day but that was when cars were late model cars was a 50 60 70s cars now those cars that used to be considered late model those are now antique and time has marched on and it is just absolutely ridiculous how many cars that i see that i say oh that's a used car it's not that's an 89 chevrolet pickup that is a square body pickup 73 to 87 91 if you consider suburbans and they blend into traffic because the mentality of everybody they see a 55 chevrolet bel air and they think old car they see a model a and they think old car they don't see a 1990 chevrolet truck or an 89 jeep cherokee and think old car yeah and i think to some degree too we we look at you know, the premise on which manufacturers are building cars today. Uh, we've talked about this in a previous detour episode. I don't believe manufacturers are specifically uh, building cars to last forever. They're, it's, it's planned obsolescence. They're building them to get, get you through warranty, maybe a few years after that, and in hopes that when that warranty has gone, you're moving on to the next one. Uh, but there's always somebody there to pick up that vehicle at that point in time, whether it's three years old, five, ten years old. Whatever the value is, there's someone there that can only afford that. 
or they're specifically looking for that. And unfortunately, there comes a point when a car's devaluation just reaches a certain point where no matter what it is, it's worth 1500 to 2000 bucks. Well, in today's market, that's probably three to 5,000 bucks. But nevertheless, as we, as we move on in time, they're still pumping out hundreds of thousands of cookie cutter cars in every brand. It doesn't matter who you are. I don't care who you are. If you're in the mainstream automotive, the big five or six or seven cars, car manufacturers, you're, you're cookie cutter stamping these cars out. One just looks like another, looks like another. Years ago, cars were different every year. It was tooling was different every year. Uh, and people nowadays, they don't necessarily want to drive that cookie cutter car. They want to drive something a little bit outside the norm. And unfortunately, we're getting penalized for that or soon to be. And I think what's going to happen in the future as time rolls on, maybe we won't see it. I mean, likely we will, but maybe our kids will be of the point where, you know, once a car reaches a certain age, you're just not going to be able to drive that. Um, it'll be able to sit in a pretty barn or in a glass case somewhere so you can look at it and wipe the dust off it. Other than that, we're going to be stuck uh, just like, uh, you know, in, 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 in China or Japan where some of these car manufacturers are selling cars there and they say, okay, once it reaches a certain year, uh, we're going to tax the crap out of it. So you can't afford to do anything. You got to get rid of it and buy a new one. And again, we're just leading, we're heading down a path that, these older vehicles, they're getting to become few and far between. Are they really that big of a detriment to the global aspect of uh, uh, the environment? What few there are left? That's what I'd like to know. Um, it's a very small percentage of cars that are over 25 years old right now that are on the planet. Do we really have that big of a footprint that we got to crack down that hard on? I do know that people are starting to shy away, and especially in Illinois, where I'm at, uh, Metro St. Louis, I'm seeing the average age of cars get older and older and older. It used to be that you never saw a 90s era Camry. You'd never see a square Cavalier. You would never see uh, a Dodge Shadow. Those cars are popping up. Mm. And it might be because the the boomer generation, the baby boomer generation that purchased those cars when they were new, that was the last car they purchased. Grandma, grandpa, uncle, aunt may have purchased that car in the late 80s, early 90s. And that is the new barn find. It's creepy and scary to think about, but I see a lot of new drivers and what people I would think is 18 to 25 year old driving a quote unquote old car. I saw a Jeep Comanche the other day. Um, you know, the, the uh, X, I, I think it's a XJ uh, pickup, you know, Jeep Comanche. Absolutely beautiful. I don't think it was restored, but it was perfect. And there was a person driving it. I don't think they were 18. And that's how I felt when I was driving a 50s era car when I was in high school in the 80s. It's the same amount of time frame. It's just how your mind sees what you think is vintage. And I think as we as it was as we come to a close on this episode, one of the things if we want to, uh, if there's one thing that we get you guys to to get out of this episode is we want to go back to our mantra: what drives youth? And that is keeping the automotive industry in the forefront. That's telling the stories, that's keeping the cars clean, that's keeping them uh, in the hands of people who want to see them still going and fighting that fight against vetoing these things out of existence. Uh, so let's, you know, bring up our children if they want to, you know, go out and buy that 30, 40 year old cars, the cars that you and I grew up with um, as our parents were buying new. Um, your teenager wants to buy one of those cars. Do not discourage. They're going to they're going to have to fix it for sure. And maybe mom and dad might have to help them. But at the end of the day, they're going to get their hands dirty uh, and they're going to learn a new trade, uh, even if it is just something uh, that they're doing on the side. So help these kids, help you know the men and women who are growing up. Uh, they don't have these trades in school anymore to learn this stuff. Let them learn on their own. Encourage them to do that. Uh, because if we don't fight the fight against vetoing and boycotting all these older, poor emissions cars, 
Um, we're just not going to have them in the future. So I hope that you understand exactly where we're coming from with this story, that uh, we we want to fight to save our industry uh, of classic cars, even if classic means 1998. So let's uh, keep this going. Uh, you know, keep spreading the, the, these stories, keep spreading out this episode uh, to all your friends who care about the car industry and want to see it saved. So folks, if you want to tell us how you feel about this, make sure you head over to our website, getoutanddrive.com and scroll all the way down to the bottom to the Lister hotline and tell us exactly how you feel. If we use your recording, we'll send you some stickers. Cruise on over to our website, getoutanddrive.com for all the info you never wanted to know about our podcast. Hit us up on our listener hotline, be the first to know what's happening, get industry news and grab your Get Out and Drive merch. Connect with us on social media. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Follow us on Twitter at Get Out and Drive Pod. What drives you here?